so my story is going to be about family and belonging and the reason why I chose this topic in particular is because I found that in my process of becoming it's it's been really important for me to find a center and a lot of the time if you're black and you're a woman and you grew up in post-apartheid suburbia it's really difficult to find your anchor and to find your center so my story basically is going to be against the backdrop of what it means when your parents win what it means when you do live in suburbia and negotiating space where you're too black for white people and you're too white for black people and i'm also going to be looking at um, hyper visibility so being you know light-skinned with a big ass and and being the property of people in the street who can call me mlungu or ngamla or yellow bone which i I hate. Um, so I'm going to be looking at that and, and what it means to be hyper visible in some spaces and completely invisible in others and negotiating space and love and the patriarchy and capitalism and all of the other isms. Cool. So I am a middle child. Um, I, I, do, I did suffer from middle child syndrome. Because when, when you're in the middle, it's kind of, you're, you're kind of always uh, negotiating your space. So if you're you know, the oldest, there are things that are expected of you. And if you're the youngest, you have all of these allowances because your parents have tested out their parenting skills on all the other children. So it's a real thing, for real. So um, I'm my... Okay, so to give you context, I'm my mother's first born and my father's third born. But because of the patriarchy, you know, um, one of the wins is that we don't have half siblings, especially not in my culture. So my older brother is my brother and my older sister is my sister. But if we're going to look at it through like uh, a white familial lens, then they are my half siblings and I have a, a younger brother. So because I've always been kind of in the middle, it's kind of, I've always had to take care of myself, um, which is why I like reading, because I, I find myself, you know, by myself a lot of the time. So I like to disappear into worlds like Harry Potter, who only after I became myself, I realized how really inherently problematic it is and how it sucks so much that J.K. Rowling can just say, yeah, I kind of meant Hermione was black, and yeah, I kind of meant Percy was gay, and yeah, babes, why did you say that in the beginning? <laughs> like, why do we have to tell authors that we want to be seen, and then only them to say, oh, actually, babes, it's kind of whatever you want it to be. Babes, no. So it's only after I became myself that I realized all of these worlds that I found myself identifying with didn't look like me. And I was watching uh, a few years ago Chimamanda talking about the danger of a single story. And I fell victim to that because living in the suburbs, um, that's kind of all you see. Um, which is why I kind of became mildly obsessed with mix it and getting those movies with a USB, you know those, where you go visit your cousin and they're playing a movie and it's on a, on a shady DVD where the picture doesn't look like what you're watching. I came up, became obsessed with those. I'm currently obsessed with the gong because I think gong is so important as a concept and as something that investigates music and structure because it's literally track 13 and it's 30 minutes and you vibe. Like, I love that. I love the fact that it's always decolonizing what we think about music and the fact that you have to be on like some shady 120 group a person WhatsApp group to actually get new tracks. I think that's amazing. So I became obsessed with things like that because in the process of becoming, I didn't see anything on TV that looked like me and I couldn't identify. So as I said, I, I wanted to talk about, you know, who I am and how I became to be, who I am and investigating. What happens when your parents buy into the Rainbow Nation and they win? What happens when you are black?
black and female and light-skinned and you, you interrogate and investigate space. So I just, I just want to make it very clear that I'm really aware of my privileges. I understand that in the world that there are certain places and certain things that I can do and say and communicate that other people may not, but that does not invalidate my lived experience. So I think oftentimes when we're talking about like the struggle and the come up and what it looks like to, to fight capitalism and to not be part of the machine, there are nuances that we tend to forget and, and we tend to look at things in binaries, which I don't think should be the case. So I think it's important for us to look at how, how kids, black kids, especially in, in post-apartheid suburbia, investigate and, and become you know, themselves. So having to be in the suburbs where my my world, my whole world was was coloured in angst. I was I was mildly depressed. I felt empty. There was nothing that felt real about suburbia. Like you have you know all of the trappings, all of the things that you're supposed to want, and it doesn't feel like anything. It feels numb, and you can't really raise that, right? Because it's like how, like and you're like. Babes, that isn't sustenance, you know, but, be, but having the language to even say that is also a privilege in itself. So you're really stuck in a world where you're investigating all sorts of things and to add, you know, race and gender onto that is, is also something in and of itself. So being in the suburbs, uh, luckily for me, I went to a um, all girls school, so I didn't have to really navigate the patriarchy in my formative years, um, which was great. Some of my best friends that I met when I was in grade nine are here. Yay. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I've known them since we were in grade nine, and Mo is, is back from China, so if you could just all give her a shout out. Hey babes. So these are my literal day ones, and I'm glad that you're all black. And <laughs> I'm glad that you're all black, and I'm glad that you're all becoming, and that you're beautiful, and that you are um, investigating and challenging things in corporate South Africa. So I'm really proud to be your guys' friends, just for one. So I met, I met um, my friends in grade nine when I came from a boarding school, because I was sick of that as well. Um, and the, the, the odd thing is going to school where you have proximity to resources and not ever investigating why you don't own any of those resources is something. So I, I used to walk um, to school and I used to walk home. I really like walking, I think it's relaxing. But on the way home, I remember this one time, I, I was right by my house, just by the bend, and this Indian man pulls up and he shows me his junk. I was, I was maybe 14, 15, and I, I had no idea what that meant or what to say, especially to my parents. Like, I had no idea what I would say, who did what, and what that conversation would be, because first of all, we had never really spoken about sex or the body or, you know, anything that could make me have the language to speak about how traumatic that experience was for me. But the scary thing is, is that that isn't the worst thing that has happened to me while I was in post-apartheid white suburbia by men of color. And that breaks my heart so much because you, you think that we're all in this together, right? We all are here to to challenge the space, we all are here to flourish and slay. This is what the white people said we couldn't get and we out here. But then it's those very same men that perpetuate violences against us. Which is, you know, symbolic of my experience as a, as a black woman. So, I used to walk home, as I, as I was saying, and 
it was therapeutic in a lot of ways, and in, in, in a lot of ways, it really gave me insights into how violent patriarchy and misogynoir is when black men feel that they have, you know, access to you, that they can call you whatever name that they feel like, even when you're in uniform and you're 14 years old, something. And to investigate those isms and say, and to have a twang and to be able to say, you know, I'm hyper visible in these spaces and, you know, as a light-skinned black woman, I identify as, and also go home and get choked up, get zoomed where your default is English because you've code switched so much that the switch doesn't go back automatically when you're home. Um, it's hard. Everything is hard. Always. But what happens when you win? Where are the conversations from the other side? What is the midpoint? What is the teenage angst? that black kids are facing in, in white suburbia currently. Sure, we'll have access to go on Tumblr and write a sad blog about how everything sucks and my mother didn't buy me you know, a PS4, oh my god, everything is ruined. But is it not valid? Why, why is it that when we talk about blackness, we, we identify and solely identify with hurt? and struggle, it, are there not gaps within blackness where we can celebrate women's? What does that look like? What does it mean when we're saying, oh, hashtag black excellence? Sure, we understand that it's in the frame of the white cis heteronormative patriarchy, but is, is it less of a win? What does it look like? What does it mean? What does it feel like to win? and to be content with your win and say, you know what, I'm not, I'm good. We talk about all the time on Twitter that the middle class isn't real. It's just a buffer for the, for the elites and the poor. What does that mean? What does that look like? What does it mean to identify? Are we not taking away people's self, um, people's agency to, to identify? and self-actualize and call themselves what they think that they are. Where does the line, where do we draw the line between investigating, unpacking, unlearning, relearning, and speaking over people and, and invalidating experiences? I had an experience on Twitter where I was talking about my experience as a, as a black, light-skinned woman. And I received a lot of backlash because it was just, oh, light-skinned tears, I mean, please. It's not like you're a dark girl and you get called this and that and the third. I, I, I don't dispute that. That is happening every day. And I'm there smashing the patriarchy every day and the misogynoir against dark-skinned black women. But also me. Those are my politics, you know? And I think it's really important to allow blackness to have spectrum and to not think of blackness as hurt and suffering. It's not that it's not, but that's not all that it is. And I think that it's important that we investigate how we speak about people and not invalidate people's experience and take every single opportunity that you have when you have privilege to speak about people that don't and to raise those issues and to be brave and say, you know, I understand that I am, am light-skinned and that is seen by some as privilege. But my experience as a light-skinned woman means that there's a running joke in my house that my great-grandmother used to say to my, in reference to my, my mother and my uncle, What? What does that mean? What does, that, what does that look like when at home the running joke is my mother and my uncle were so fair that they were referred to as Amelu or Amapun? Aren't these the same people that were fighting? Aren't these the same people that were tear gassing? 
that are tear gassing us, excuse me, what does it mean then that the come up looks similarly like their existence? What does it mean to thrive in that existence? To say, yeah, I know that I'm, you know, um, my mother's very beautiful and she's very smart. But I often think about how she navigated post apartheid, you know, um, capitalism. She was like, she was young, she was like 24 and just, you know, doing the most, slaying here, there, and the, in the next place. But I always, I always ask her, I'm just like, how did you do it? How did you investigate this? And she's like, no, mana, what you must do is you must put your head down, Museveens. Museveens, you must just work for you. I'm just like, have you met me? Me, put my head down. <laughs> me, na, linga, how do you, how do you mean, babes? But that's, that's her reality. What does it mean for me who's just like a rearing fighter that's just like, no, babes, not here. I will show you, Becky. What does that mean? What does that mean? Is there, is there space, is there allowance for me to be black in that way and be extra and use my hands and listen to weak women and be like, yeah, bitch, what? And also be able to articulate an argument in such a way that it smashes your whole thing. What does that mean? Do we make allowances? Honestly, do we make allowances to have a spectrum of blackness, of womanhood, of white suburbia, of what it looks like to win, and the winning is not the things. Smash the winning, but what if you're already winning? What do you do with your car payments? Do you not pay your bond? What do you do, babes? What do you do? So, I just, I, just wanna, I just wanna wrap up by saying, I am a paradox who code switches and exists in the world of double consciousness. I investigate space and culture and race and sex and love and capitalism and all the other isms constantly checking, learning, unlearning, relearning. And I implore you to do the same. Thank you.